Hello everybody and welcome to the Basement Basement Boys Podcast. I am Chris Gray, that is Eric Mincer. Unfortunately, Devin cannot be with us today. He has he has one of those things called a child. He's got daddy duties. And I think I think those things take up a lot of your time from what I've been told. Devin's running daddy daycare. <laughs> If anybody wants to drop out their child with Devin, I'm signing him up. I'm just kidding. Don't don't drop your child yeah, off with Devin. Do it's, not bring your child to Devin's house. It's, it's, just, just, <laughs> it's just not fair to him. It's also a pandemic. Probably shouldn't be yeah. just changing. Yeah. Just throwing just, it just to some, that. Just another that. random dude that you don't know because a podcast told you. Anyway, let's keep it moving. We got a lot to catch up on. Everybody wanted to talk shit, Eric. Everybody wanted to tell me how I was a dumbass and throwing money away. There are haters, losers everywhere coming at you. The fake news media didn't want to believe in you, but you kind of called it. And I don't know about you, but I made me money. I got some money off of it. Made some of him money. Hopefully made some of you money for you smart motherfuckers who listen to me. We don't have to talk about how some of the other fights were not good, but you know. So just to... (laughs) Put it into the air. What we're talking about is Conor McGregor losing to Dustin Poirier. It's weird. I should probably say Dustin Poirier beating Conor McGregor. That was a big Saturday night event. First time he's ever got knocked out in his MMA career. He got TKO'd against Floyd, but he wasn't buzzed like he was in this fight. That's the thing is it's not just that Conor lost because, like, that's sports. People lose. Your, your favorite team, best teams, people lose. It happens. He got night-night knocked out. Yeah, like he he said he never really got buzzed, but I and that it was all the leg, I don't believe it. And but I do think this fight is a testament to just how far the cat like the low calf kick has come in the arsenal of people. It is one of the most necessary strikes to have in your arsenal and to be able to defend. Because we've just we've been seeing it so much recently we saw it we saw it in this fight how it dead it is like there was the sean o'malley fight there was the a few years back michael chandler who also fought this night um back in bellator against brent primus there henry cejudo um almost lost that first round to demetrius johnson because of the low calf kick because it you have to understand the shin bone is hard it's connected to your Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> the shin bone is very hard, but all this calf behind it is weak, pliable, soft tissue, and it is literally the base of your whole body. So once that's compromised, there's nothing you can do. The low calf kick is such an important technique in today's MMA world, and I'm honestly surprised it took this long to figure that out, even on my level. Like, I didn't even realize how effective it was. But it just, that really made that fight. After the first two he, like, he took, his leg was compromised. And then you saw after the fight, Connor was walking out in crutches. Yeah, because it's not so much, like, it hurts. Getting hit hurts. But when you're in there... The adrenaline, like, you can take shots to the face. Like, you feel them. They don't feel great. But it's not the same as if, I mean, you were just sitting here and all of a sudden from behind someone slapped you in the face. It's not the same type of thing with the adrenaline. Right. So, but even with that, it's not so much that it hurts. Because, like, yeah, everything hurts. You're not a professional fighter at that level if you can't withstand pain. It makes your entire leg shut down. So you can't feel it, you can't control it, you can't do anything with it. And that's what happened to Connor. And even when he was checking it, if you don't completely get your full check behind it, and it makes contact with the muscle in any way, it still has the capability of doing the exact same damage. Well, he talked all that shit and didn't have a leg to stand on. Oh my god. He actually did not talk shit this time. (laughs) He actually didn't talk shit this time, which is kind of weird. Humble Connor's been a thing. My question for you is, do you think it's humble Connor. Do you think Connor kind of had an idea going into this fight that there was a chance that this could happen? No, he did the same thing in the Cerrone fight, and so he fucked up Cerrone. I think, I think the biggest switch for him, in my opinion, was having children. I think he understands, like, 
okay, I have two little humans, and I think a third on the way at this point, that look up to me. Like, I need to set a good example for what I want for them. Wow. Because that's when I feel like the switch happened. Yeah, he did some dumb shit. Yeah, like he hit the whole the old man. After, I think it was after Connor Jr. was born, but before his daughter was born. That happened. I could be wrong on that, but... Connor seems like the type of person that would name both his son and daughter Connor Jr. <laughs> so um, seems like I forget the daughter's name. Fatherhood's the running theme of the show so far. Connor, Devin, parents. Yeah. From what we hear, it changes you. Yeah, we're lucky enough to not know yet, so... <laughs> yeah, so for the casual fan watching this, uh, what is... What about Poirier, other than the leg kicks, like... What about Poirier just put him head and shoulders above Connor, just knocked him out? I think a, a big thing about this fight, I think if they did it at 145 again, it had a better shot for Connor to repeat the same result as last time because Poirier did eat some big shots. Connor landed. Right. Like I was watching it, it looked like it really looked like an evenly matched fight, and like Connor was in it until he wasn't. It yeah. just seemed like it was, it was just back and forth, back and forth. Connor's down, Connor's asleep. Yeah. And. But and that was the thing, and he Poirier ate some big shots, man, some big shots, some shots that had put away a lot of other guys. Yeah, he's just a very like salt of the earth tough dude, but not cutting all that weight, not depleting himself the way he was, will strengthen your chin. It makes it, it makes it can make a world of difference. You're not you when you're hungry. <laughs> Sorry. He definitely. Poirier's definitely be, been eating some Snickers, man, because he's a lot bigger than when he was at 145. Um, it's bulking season. But, yeah, I, I think the weight class played a big, big part in it. He wasn't depleting himself. His chin was there. He's just a bigger, more imposing dude at 155. Like, when you saw him fight Max Holloway, who moved up from 145 to 155 to try to get the interim belt when Khabib got hurt or when he got suspended, one of those, you saw in that fight just how huge he was compared to Max Holloway. It did not look like these two humans should have been fighting each other. He's not the same as when he was at 145. He's not, he didn't just say, okay, I'm not going to cut as much and stay where he was. No, he put on weight. Not enough to make, it, make the cut like it was at 45, but he's still cutting a solid amount of weight. So where it's different that he's not quite depleting himself as much, He's also not, comp- like, Donald Taroni, when he went up to 170 from 155, he just did all the same shit and just didn't cut any weight. Right. So he was very undersized for the division, where Poirier transitioned to the weight healthily, put on weight to make himself be able to compete at that division, and he's a very big 155er at this point. It's just... He brought it to levels where it's manageable comparatively to 145. And I think that was one of the, I think that was probably the biggest factor. I think if this fight was at 145 like it used to be, like, like it was the first time they fought, I think the result prob- probably would have lent more towards Connor just because he did connect with big shots. Right. So, and- all right, go ahead. No, that's it. You're good. Oh no, I was just gonna say. So, what do you think happens next for each of these fighters? Like, what's Poirier's next fight? What's what's Connor's next move? Um. Well, Khabib said he doesn't want to come back. He like, he wasn't impressed enough to like make to like get that fire building back inside of him. He was talking shit right after the fight, didn't he say? Yeah, I I don't like that. I think Khabib gets very out of character with Connor because he doesn't like him that much. Right. Because his character, he's a very respectful guy. He's a, he's a devout Muslim. He's he's very, like, just, you do you. I'll do, like, you respect me. I respect you. Like, I'm not going to. He's not the guy to come out. He's not a Conor McGregor who's going to come out and say, oh, fuck that guy. Right. You know, blah, 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 blah. But I think his hate for Conor McGregor is so deep-rooted that, because, I mean, Conor said some fucked up things about him. I was about to say, Conor, kind of. I get that Connor tries to press buttons and get under people's skin, but Connor seemed like he really did cross a line yeah. with Khabib before their fight, and that's why we had the whole going into the crowd and the whole fiasco that happened after that. Well, see, that's the thing. Everyone was just like, oh, this is what Connor does. Connor does. 
I like it really wasn't though because like you saw the Floyd Mayweather fight. Yeah, he made some dumb comments that like he got in trouble for, but they were all in jest. Yeah. They were all in fun. There's he just... wasn't he wasn't intending to mean what he did. Not that he shouldn't have gotten the flack that he got for saying the things. There's like a difference a... between showmanship of like I'm trash talking to get you know people to buy pay per view, and then just blatantly disrespecting Khabib, Khabib's family, Khabib's religion. That first press conference they had when the fight when the fight was announced, like uh last year or two years ago whenever it was he that press conference was so dark like it was one of those press conferences where you watch it and afterwards you're just like i feel dirty like yeah. i need a shower yeah like it was personal and it was angry and it was hateful and like connor man does his research he was talking about how khabib's manager who's also a muslim um, apparently was an informant for terrorist organizations in his home country. Um, so like, yeah, it, it got all very dark, very, very yeah. dark. This convo took a turn. Ex- well, it's because it's be, it's a bunch of things. First, Khabib's never liked Connor because he's that outlandish guy and he was trying to get the fight and Connor didn't take the fight because it wasn't the big fight at the time. Um, so that started to be where that, and then Connor's main training partner, Artem Lobov, was, said something, he, Con, Artem Lobov is from Russia, moved to England, he considers himself a little, uh, moved to Ireland, considers himself a little bit of each, like he brings out a dual flag that's like sewn to each other of Ireland and Russia. Interesting. Um, he sounds so weird. He talks like Connor, but with a little Russian accent on top of it. It sounds so weird. Sounds hilarious. But I guess he's, he said something about Khabib and how he's not on Connor's le- level and blah, 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 blah. And so he comes up, so Khabib comes up and goes, oh, we're countrymen, blah, 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 and, like, slaps him in the face and tries to intimidate him, and that's what ha- That's why Connor went down to the Barclay Center and did the whole dolly and the bus thing. And so it just, even before the fight, it was already a just a crazy, crazy mess. So what's but what's next for Connor? Next for Connor. Sorry, hold on. I just want to answer the first question you asked. What's next? I think for Poirier is I think he fights Charles. What I think should happen is he should fight Charles Oliveira. Sorry, I just got off on that long tangent explaining why the Khabib thing was crazy. Um, I think. Personally, I think he fights Charles Oliveira. I think that's the fight that needs to happen. I think unless you're... Poirier has defeated every top name in the division, except Oliveira, I think. I don't think they fought yet. And he's been doing it for years. He dropped one to Khabib, and then he got caught against Michael Chandler. Uh, not Michael Chandler. Michael, uh, Michael Johnson. But everyone knows if you do the Poirier, Michael Johnson fight ten times, Poirier is gonna win nine of them. You know what I mean? He yeah. got he got caught. It He's happens. He's just a better fighter. Yeah, especially at this point. So those are the only two losses out of fourteen fights now, at lightweight. Because he moved up after the original Connor fight. Okay. So he has staked his claim that if Khabib's not coming back. I'm one of the top two guys. I've beaten everybody. He's beaten Gaethje. He's beaten... He hasn't beaten Ferguson, but he hasn't fought him yet. But Ferguson's also taken a step back because he's lost two. And I just... I really don't see anyone else who has a claim to that intern title fight like him. Dana has said he wants him to fight Michael Chandler, but Poirier came out and said, in no uncertain terms, no, I'm not fighting Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler has come in, had one fight in the UFC against a guy he's already beat. Not on his level, basically. He didn't even say that. He was, he, he was actually very respectful in saying, like, look, I'm not saying Michael Chandler is not one of the best fighters in the world. I'm not saying Michael Chandler has, doesn't have a great body of work. I'm not saying his win wasn't spectacular. But he put in a long, long, tough road to get into the UFC title picture. This guy who comes in for one fight. Like has he, he one, hasn't earned it yet. Yeah. 
get a couple more fights in the division, beat some of these other top guys, and then come talk to me is basically what he said. Yeah. Like, okay. he, and he's he's not even like he's even said like he could go on a run right now and get another two three wins by the end of the year, and then we can talk. Right. But until you do that, one fight ain't gonna cut it. He just hasn't earned his spot yet. I get that. Um. So I think Charles Oliveira would be the fight because. Charles Oliveira has been on an absolute tear himself. He looked unstoppable in the last fight about against Tony against Tony Ferguson. Right, that's the one we watched together. Yeah, and it he he deserves a shot too. He's been in the UFC forever, working his way up, doing different things. I think he was also at one forty five at one point and then moved up. And he just he looks like an absolute assassin. He did to Tony Ferguson, to Tony Ferguson, one of the best lightweights ever. He did to Tony Ferguson what Valentina Shevchenko does to everyone at flyweight because no one's on Valentina's level at flyweight. Okay. Um, so I really, I really think that should be the fight. What I think Connor does next, I think he has a couple options. I think everybody wants to, wants to see him fight Gaethje. I don't know if that's the way the UFC would go for it because I think they would want to give him a better matchup for him than Gaethje is because Gaethje is a stand-up guy. Like he, he likes to fight stand-up, but like you can't sleep on the guy's wrestling. I know it didn't look like it against Khabib, but that's because Khabib's level of wrestling is astronomical to anyone. That's because Khabib wrestled bears. Yeah. And he's just, he's been in this training regiment for as long as he's been alive. Again, if you don't know what we're talking about, Pause this video right now, open a new tab, search Khabib Wrestling Bear. As a child, he wrestled bears. Anyways. But he's he's literally been on, like, a pro training regimen since he was six years old. Same. So, it's like, there's a level of wrestling that comes with that. So, I don't think Gaethje's a good matchup for Connor, so I don't think they'd go that route. They've also... Connor says he wants that Poirier rematch right away. And Poirier says, hey, I'm, I'm down to give it to the guy. We're one and one now. Let's get the rubber match in. And I'm sure per- Poirier is fine with it because if he can beat Connor twice, that definitely makes him more noteworthy in terms of fans. Yeah, and I don't know, I don't know what his contract's like, but if he has any type of pay-per-view points in there, Connor's the one to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Everyone wants Connor for the pay-per-views, which leads my question can the people get what the people want? Will we get Connor versus Nate Diaz again? That was where I was going to go next. That's the third option in this like little love triangle of fights Connor could have. I think this probably would be, unless doing the Poirier fight, I would say this would be the perfect time to do it. Yes. Because that fight's never going away. Nate and Connor could lose, both lose their next 10 fights. And everyone would want to see that again because it was just such a grudge match. There was a slugfest. Was... And they they both just stay, like, talking shit on Twitter all the time. Because that's just who they are. Yeah. Like, and no, like, it's not even, like, cringeworthy. Like, other people, like, will make it. Like, it's just who they are. Like, you know, what? It, like you just said, it's Nate Diaz, after every fight, if there's a 155 or a 170 pounder there, it's just like, I can beat that bum. Fuck out of here. Nate Diaz, just, he just stays ripping tequila, smoking blunts. Being who he is, very confident, but, but you know, a great fighter. Connor, as we all know, is very confident. Connor's, you know, taking a step back with this loss. What do you think it means for, uh, like, the UFC as a whole going forward to see Connor, who is, you know, the biggest draw, not at the top of his game? As much as I think half the stuff Dana puts out is, like, full of shit, and, like, I get it. You're, like, I'm not even trying to shit on Dana saying that. You're a businessman. You want to control your narrative. That's how every business in right. America works. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but you can't really necessarily trust what he says, even though he always says, oh, unless it comes from us, don't believe it. It's just like, yeah, that's not how the world works, my guy. But So what's the latest that he said? Um, well, just any time they talk about, oh, can the UFC make it without Conor McGregor? Do you really need Conor McGregor back? Like, yes, I get it that no one has ever been the level of Conor. But this sport has also never been 
as big as it has been. And they were, they've always said that. They said it when Gracie re- like stopped fighting in the UFC. They said it when Chuck Liddell retired. They said it when like Tito Ortiz left. They said it when Randy Couture left. They said it when Brock left. They said it when Ronda left. Oh, the UFC is not going to, the UFC is going to survive. There's always good fighters. There are so many more people working towards this thing because there's now monetary, like it, you, you have the ability to make money now in this sport. Right. So all the big athletes, like if you were, if you were like, if you like wrestling, kids are more likely to go into wrestling now instead of say football because there's a path there. Right. Where there wouldn't be in the past. But like you were just saying, in terms of uh, pay-per-view, like, yes, the sport will survive without Conor, but it's not, it's not a secret that Conor sells more pay-per-views than almost any other fighter, right? Yeah. No, it's 100%. Like, he definitely does sell the most pay-per-views. He's definitely the most popular star. Like, I'm not trying to take away from what Conor does. It's like, if Conor fights, I'm paying attention to it because it's Conor, where you're going to watch no matter who's fighting. Like, you're going to pay attention to pretty much every important UFC fight. I'm not as drawn into the sport as you are, but I will watch Conor because he's more noteworthy. Right, but there are other people. Like, people are starting to attach to Gaethje and make him more of a star. Like, Kevin Holland's getting a big bump right now because he's also the guy who was talking shit where Joe Rogan was just like, how is he fucking talking this much? Okay, but even that, like, you have to remind me. Yeah. Whereas with Conor, you just say Conor and you know who he is. Right. He's I, on that first name level. I get that, but there's enough stars that even though they won't get that a million and a half by pay per view every year, they'll they have enough stars to keep a steady round of eight hundred thousand buys every year. Especially and especially with this ESPN deal now, the way they have the deal structure is no matter how many pay per views they sell, they get paid a flat rate. So they could sell a thousand pay per views. And yeah. they're getting paid for, I think it's like 400,000 pay-per-views. Yeah. ESPN, that's all they need. That's the Disney money. You got the mouse in the house. Yeah. So that's all, they, that's all they need. You know what I mean? I think ESPN would suffer more from Connor leaving at this point than the UFC would. Okay. That makes sense. The, they, the, re- the only reason the UFC cares about pay-per-view buys now is to show that return on investment to ESPN. If you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense to me. I think. So I still think they'd suffer without Connor, but I, I see your point. I see what you're saying that they have enough stars that the, the sport itself will stay afloat. Yeah, like it's not like it's not what you want. You always like the NBA doesn't want LeBron to retire, but it's gonna happen. The NBA didn't want MJ to retire because having MJ in meant more jersey sales, more ticket sales, more viewers. Okay, but the NBA with Jordan particularly, the years when Jordan won those championships in the 90s versus when Jordan retired. The ratings had incredible drops. It was like a 73% drop after his first retirement in the finals. Like, just Jordan being Jordan. He would literally, you know, asses in seats. He would sell out every arena. Everybody wanted to watch everything he did. And I'm not saying that when you had, you know, other great teams, they would still sell out. But the, the national attention dropped. And that's basketball, whereas UFC is a less popular sport, or MMA is a less popular sport, UFC is a smaller business, I think Connor would, you know. But it is also the fastest growing sport in the world. There is, you cannot say anything different. Faster than lacrosse? Way faster than lacrosse, my Fuck. guy. Gotta return my lacrosse gear. But, um, like, yeah, don't get me wrong, the NFL and the NBA are fucking light years away from where the UFC is. But in the ter- in the terms of exponential growth throughout the throughout each year or season or whatever you want to call it, it's the UFC by a long shot. It's MMA by a long shot. No one gave a shit about Bellator four years ago. There are pr- Bellator is putting on some good fights at this point. No, I didn't. No one. I didn't even know one existed two three years ago. One is putting on some good fights at this point. I know that I know I'm a hardcore and there's a casuals, but it's MMA as a whole is growing, not just the UFC, but the UFC is growing exponentially every every year. Right. I I mean I think you're right that you, the ESPN deal obviously has a lot to do with that. So well, yeah, like with Jordan, it's gonna hurt. I'm not saying it's not gonna hurt, 
But if you look at the NBA now compared to what it's been, what it was back then, it's the biggest it's ever been. Again, that also goes back to TV deals. Right. But yes. So. I wrote a whole book about it. Well, yeah, it might in the short term might, might not be the best for them if he retired, which again, I don't think he's going to. I'm just saying without the UFC will be fine without him. It might take a little tweak into things, but it's going to be fine. Who would you say is the next big star personality wise? Because mm. I think that's what separates Connor. It's like you do have other exciting fighters. There are other people like Kevin Holland is fun to watch, but he's not the same where as you interview him afterwards, he's like, you know, Connor, everybody quotes Connor. I apologize for absolutely fucking nothing. Like, yeah, see, that's, a, that's he has like hard. A, I would say. If I had to pick one, I'd say Sean O'Malley. Um, but he's been he's is he the guy with the mustache? No, he's the guy with the rainbow hair. Rainbow hair. Um, the only problem with him is he's been inactive and he got stopped his last fight. Um, originally he got inactive for, I believe it was taped in supplements, and then he got a marijuana pop or something like that. Lay off the weed. <laughs> Me and Devin literally quote that every day. <laughs> Way off. But they've changed their policies, kind of like the NFL has now, so it's not like... Literally, the way they have it set up now is if you test positive for weed, they go, hey, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> like, literally, they've just said, it's against the rules, but we, we're not going to do anything. Okay. <laughs> It's fucking the craziest thing. The NFL, I think, stopped testing for it. I think the NFL is like, yeah, yeah, if you want, whatever. Yeah, so, but the UFC is going to be fine. But I don't think they have to worry about that because Connor came out, wants to fight. Apparently, according to his coach behind the scenes, is clamoring for everyone. Like, get this fight set up again. We're doing the third right now. With Poirier? Yeah. No, Diaz. I just think... Everyone, after every Conor fight, everyone's just like, oh, perfect time for Diaz. Perfect. There's never not going to be a perfect time for Diaz. So why isn't it happening? Is Diaz the one holding out? Yeah, he always, ever since the first Conor fight, he's, he, he, it's a big deal to get him in there because he wants more money every time. Because you, you have to understand, he went from making like 45 and 45 to I think he made like 7 million for the Conor fight. So it's, he, he went from making $90,000 only if he won. To seven million, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a nice chunk of change. I'd do that. I'd I'd fight Conor McGregor for seven million. Right. So, they'll be fine. Sean O'Malley probably has the best because he's very quoted. Everyone likes him. He has flashy knockouts and stuff like that. So he's probably the next big star if I, if he can string it together. He lost to Cheeto Vera, but that was another thing. Low calf kick killed his leg. What are you gonna do? The big lesson of the weekend in terms of Conor McGregor is low calf kicks kill. Yeah. All right, kids. Should we talk about the big name? <sighs> Jake Paul is being, it's announced that he's going to fight Ben Askren. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Um, so here's the thing. It's Paul. 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 Here's the thing with Jake Paul in this fight. It's on my birthday, so that's cool. First of all, I've gone into the fact that I don't like them. But they're they they can box. You know what I mean? I think they can I think they think they can box better than they can actually box, but they can actually box. We've been through all that. I have to say, I really do. He's playing this super smart. The way he's going about it. He was calling out he started like, yeah, he says his eventual goal is to fight Conor McGregor, and I think that's still probably his goal and he's probably working on it. Because even if even if he fought him right now and lost, because he would, Connor's a way better boxer than him. Mm. Um, he would still be making a lot of money. Yeah, the, he literally has fifty million dollars just sitting in a bank account, waiting for Conor McGregor to take the fight as proof of funds. Um, <laughs> so, but he also called out Ben Askren and Conor McGregor's jujitsu coach, who's in Bellator, who everyone hates because. All he does is talk shit and is an asshole. Dylan Dennis. Um, but the reason I don't like Dylan Dennis is Dylan Dennis talks shit and then will get offered the fight and not take the fight. Oh, so he's scared. Yeah, I really honestly think Dylan Dennis, because apparently 
Dylan Dennis was in the driver's seat to get this fight. This is what Ben Askren said on, I believe it was Ariel Helwani's show. He was the front runner to get the fight and turned down the fight because it was boxing and not MMA. Interesting. Because he's a jiu-jitsu guy. He's a grappler. He cannot fucking box, and he knows it. Well, that's the thing now. Isn't Ben Askren also A wrestler. Not, yeah, I was going to say, he's never had a professional boxing match, right? No, and... So they're both making their professional debuts? No, his last two fights, when he knocked out Nate Robinson, that was a pro fight. Oh, okay. Um, oh, sorry, Nate. He... Ben Askren is very much a strict wrestling specialist. He was involved in what the world has called the worst striking fight ever in MMA between him and Damian Maya because it was supposed to be the wrestler versus the jiu-jitsu guy, like the best of each. And But the thing about that is when people would think, oh, this is going to be a grappling showcase, both of those guys know the other guy is that good at grappling, so they think they can get the advantage on the on the feet. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like when we both think we're going to throw a rock, so we both throw scissors. Yeah. Gotcha. So he... Wait, that doesn't work. No, I, it kind of does. If I think you're going to throw a rock, why would I throw scissors? I throw paper. You, the you know what I mean. And that really made sense to me, because I feel like if somebody had a rock and somebody had a paper, the person with the rock would win the fight. Um... True. Anyways, Jake Paul. So I think, but Ben Askren is not a good stand-up fighter, but to his credit, he's also been through 19 professional fights where they all start on the feet. And he even said it himself. Look, when I was in MMA, I was not training to be a striker. I was training to get as close to you as I can, get my hands on you, take you down, and now you're fucking in my world. You know what I mean? That sounds like the Harvey Weinstein. Sorry about that one. Um, <laughs> um, so Jake Paul does a lot of his promoting on YouTube. Do you think we'll ever see an MMA fight or boxing match pay-per-view on YouTube? Oh, yeah, 100%. I, I 100% think it will happen. Do you think Connor the, will ever fight Jake Paul? I think the first KSI Logan Paul card, which Jake also fought on, he fought uh, KSI's brother. He... I think that was, uh, I think that was the YouTube pay per view. Wow. Okay. Spoke into existence. Um, I think it was only like ten bucks, but. But still, great for Jake Paul making. I mean, you gotta give him credit for making his whole fan base, you know, making a career out of himself just by, literally pure hype. This guy. Pure hype. Um. But Ben Askren, just to finish up my point, Ben Askren is training with Michael Chandler, who we saw knock the fuck out of um, uh, Dan Hooker right before the Connor fight. He trains with Tyron Woodley, former one of the greatest 170-pound champions ever in the UFC. He trains with... uh, Who's the third big one? But he, he, he he has a good group of people around him, guys who can strike. Michael Chandler's not the best striker in the world, but he can strike. Tyron Woodley was a monster striker, also a monster wrestler, but a monster striker. These guys, like, he has the people around him where I feel like if he funneled all that energy into straight striking, it's going to be a lot better a fight than some people are giving him credit for. Honestly, though, I think Jake Paul takes it from what I've seen from him. He's He's just quicker and easier moving on the feet. And I don't like saying that because... Like I'm not a huge Ben Askren fan. I think he's a kind of corny at sometimes. I don't like. I don't like not like the guy. I just think he's kind of corny at sometimes. But I don't like Jake Paul, <laughs> so I don't like saying that. But I really, I'm gonna have to sit on it a little more. See some training footage from Ben. But yeah, we got about two and a half months before that. That so we'll see where the sports books open out with the odds makers say, and then I'll take your word for it because you you said Poirier and McGregor was gonna be a toss up. You said Poirier being an underdog was just too good of a value to pass up. And it, it, re- and it really worked. was. Like, don't get me wrong. I wasn't going into that fight being like, yo, Poirier's taking it. Like, blah, blah, blah. There's no, like, Connor's not on his level. No, I'm not that stupid. No, but you were basically saying it was like a 50-50 where Vegas, the odds makers, basically said, all right, we think Connor has like a 70% chance of winning. Right, exactly. So it was just too good of odds to pass up on. 
but yeah. Uh, so that's just my thoughts on it. He's doing it very smart in taking actual legitimate fighters, just putting them in something that's out of their element, but being able to use that for credibility now. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, to me, it's incredible. He has 20 million YouTube followers, so he has this built-in following. So if you're Ben Askren, kind of makes sense to accept the fight because, yeah, you're fighting a YouTuber, but you're also giving yourself this huge platform because now people are going to see what you really have. Well, he even said this is going to be the single most amount of money he's ever made for a single fight. Wow. And, like, he's fought in the UFC. He's fought in one. He's fought in Bellator. He's been through all the major organizations. Jake Paul money. I had another point, but I cannot. Oh, yeah. But, like, he's this has been a plan from Jake Paul. He started off, he did a couple of amateur fights against some other YouTubers. Everyone thought that was cool. He finally turns pro, fights another YouTube guy that turned pro, beats him. Everyone's just like, oh, yeah, but it's a YouTube guy. It's not like it's an actual athlete. He moves up. Uh, Nate. Nate Robinson beats him. He's like, okay, professional athlete. Here we are. Everyone's like, yeah, he's a professional athlete, but he's not a professional fighter. So now he's moving on to a professional fighter. Not a professional boxer, but a professional fighter. Who, ha- who is probably a great stylistic matchup for him. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a good match. He's, if he wins that fight, he's going he's gonna to try to move on to like the Dylan Dennis of the world. Or someone with a little more striking. Like he's building it up slowly to try to get to Connor. And I, it's, I have to give it to him. It's a very smart play. Do you think it'll eventually happen? He will eventually fight Connor? Uh, if, he can keep up, if he can keep building like this, I think it'll get to a point where it's just so much money there to be made. That Connor's just going to say yes. Yeah. Might as well knock this guy out and get paid $50 million. Yeah. I'd do it. But he also... See, that's the other thing. Everyone's like, oh, just make the fight right now. Just make the fight right now. There's no commission in the world would ever fucking sanction that fight. Connor has fought the best professional boxer ever, has had like 20, 30 fights already. Right. You know what I mean? Against a guy who's had two professional fights, never fought an actual professional fighter. You know what I mean? It's it's just not the same. Right. Like what Jake Paul did to Nate Robinson, Connor would do to Jake in like a minute. Yeah. Okay. I I fully believe that. Yeah. Because like I said, they can box, but they think they can box way better than they can actually box. All right. So that's that's all I got on that. Sorry I went on a, off on a long tangent on that, but you never, know me and my fighting. Never apologize for your passion, my friend. Let's dive into Championship Sunday. The big matchup. I was really excited for this first game. The NFC Championship. The Battle of the Bays. Tampa Bay goes into the frozen tundra of Green Bay. And Tom Brady is going back to the Super Bowl. The Bucks won the game. Aaron Rodgers was not happy at the end of the game. We have some uh some thoughts. Yeah. We also have some calls we can get to. Yeah, this the thing with that is I'll get into it heavily after the call, but I don't. I think people are making way more out of this Aaron Rodgers quote than ever. Like, yeah, he's frustrated. You're a game away from the Super Bowl. You lost the game. Everyone's frustrated there. But the comments he made, I don't think, were as inflammatory as we thought. Let's get to the call. No, I agree. I think he was just. That's just like, yeah, in the heat of the moment, you're pissed off because you you want to go to the Super Bowl. Everybody, yeah, okay. Um, I saw a lot of people all over the place saying that it was all on Matt LaFleur. I think we have to be fair, though. Aaron Rodgers in the office played like crap. He couldn't move. They gave the, they turned the ball over three times, and they couldn't do anything with it. Granted that it was all the anger directed at LaFleur is granted. It's just it's not completely his fault for the loss. Um, and for the prediction of the Super Bowl, it, Chiefs are going to run away with this for a mile. This is Tampa Bay did not impress me, so I don't see how they could win this upcoming game. There's no way, if, there's no way that they could win 
well, there's no way they can play like they played last week and could be considered for a good team. It just doesn't seem right this year. But congrats to Tom Brady, and have a good podcast, guys. Thank you for your call, Cole. Thank you. Hope you're feeling better, my guy. Yeah, had a little bout with the Coco, but he's beat it. Back better than ever. All right. I, I agree and disagree. I don't like that you put all that blame on Rodgers for that. Because when you're watching the game, like, you so, it just, the res- I don't know what it was. Like, not Deontay, not uh, Devontae, because Devontae's Devontae and he's fucking great. But, like, his other guys, like, MBS. MBS had a good game. He had a good game. But, like, especially, like, Lazard. And, like, they just seemed to not be timed up. I don't know why. I don't know why they chose this game to make it happen. But you'd see, especially, like, especially when targeting, like, Lazard. And I feel like Tunyon a little bit, too. He, like, but, main, like, mainly Lazard. There's a couple of points where... You saw, the you saw the play like coming together, and you saw him. You saw him throw it, and you could tell like Lazard just cut at the wrong time. Like maybe he'd go to the two yards at the hash, cut. He'd go one and a half, cut. Yeah. And that little extra six inches makes the biggest difference in a game as controlled or attempting to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just I felt like the uh, some of the receivers were off timing with him and I felt like that played a big big factor I understand he threw two picks but I also think that a receiver not being where he's supposed to be can lead to these things as well I think you got to give a lot of credit to the Bucks defense because the Bucks yeah. defense played a great game JPP looking like you know oh yeah looking young again don't get me wrong he had guys in his face all night he was not in the place to have the best game ever yeah. you know what I mean and I'm Todd, not th- Todd I'm not Bowles, even saying he congrats. did Former Jets head coach Todd Bowles looking, looking sharp. I mean, that's a, the the Packers had a great def, a uh, great offense all year. But like I was saying for most of the year, like I was concerned with this team. Like when they lost at home to Minnesota, I was saying to you, are we concerned? When they let the Jaguars play a close game with them in Green Bay, I was concerned. I think this this Green Bay team, as great as they've been, there was never that like, you know, complete dominance that we see with the Chiefs or like we used to see with the Patriots or just, I don't know, even last year, the 49ers, the way their defense played, like you knew that there were just games that are just done from the second it started. And I don't think we like, yes, the Green Bay had the dominant performance against the Bears, but there's just so many times this year where they just didn't, they just didn't look like the Super Bowl team. I mean, they lost to the same Tampa team, 38 to 10. Like right. they, they, I don't know. I think, a lot of blame to go around. So obviously we got to get to LaFleur choosing to go for a field goal when they were down by eight, two minutes left, ball at like the 10 yard line. You have Aaron fucking Rodgers. You have the MVP you have Devonte Adams. That's, that was like the most chicken ship, like spineless call. Uh, a lot of green Bay is going to call him Matt LaFraud. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Honestly, at this point, I completely agree with it. Cause in that situation, where either way, you're going to need a touchdown. Whether or not you get the field goal or not, and I understand you want to put yourself in position that you could get the field goal, blah, 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 or, you know what I mean? But you are going to need the touchdown. Yeah. You are at the, I think it was the six-yard line. And you take the ball out of your best player's hands. And someone who might be the best player in the league this year. He's going to win the MVP. Yeah. He... I don't understand in that scenario why you do that. And see, that's the thing. Everyone is blaming Rodgers for the play before. Not running it in, trying to fit it into Lazard where there was really no hole. I'm fully convinced, and I'm pretty sure he even said it in the post-fight, the post-fight, the post-game press conference. Look, I expected this to be a fourth, like a four-down scenario. I was not going to risk taking the sack to make it harder for ourselves to get that touchdown on fourth down. Right. So, all in all, that's probably the right decision in that spot. I understand that he had... What, a, kicking the field goal is the right decision? No. Oh, oh no, you mean Rodgers not... Not running yeah, it in. Yeah, okay. You know, and it was a safer option. Right, right, right. Um, Rick Riley, Sports Illustrated's mostly golf writer, had a great tweet where he said, 
when you're down by eight and you're kick- kicking a field goal down by eight is kind of like having a ham sandwich when you're drowning. Yeah. It just doesn't have, like, no, there's, there's, that was just so stupid because, like, okay, worst case, you don't get it. The Bucks have the ball at the six. Brady had thrown three interceptions at that point. Like, it's not like, yes, yeah, Brady, as Brady and the, the great offense, they could beat you. But, you know, your defense is making stops. Jair Alexander was targeted four times. They passed to who he was covering, and he had two interceptions. Like, right. Jair Alexander is an absolute monster for the Packers on defense. You got to trust your defense a little bit in case you don't get it. But you got to trust Aaron Rodgers. Like you were just saying, the best player, you got to put the ball in his hands. This reminds me of in the World Series when the Tampa Bay Rays took out Blake Snell and then they lost the game. Or the year before that when the Houston Astros decided not to use Garrett Cole in Game 7. Like, There's a certain upper echelon elite players that you trust in those situations and Aaron Rodgers, you got to trust him. When your back's against the wall, you should want the ball in your best player's hands, period. That's it. That's done. I don't care what sport it is. But also, just think of it from field position, where, like, if the Bucks get the ball at the six with an eight-point lead, rather than they, what they ended up doing was the Bucks get the ball on a touchback at the 25 with a five-point lead. So you're giving them an extra 20 yards to take away what was a one-score game to stay at a one-score game. So, Matt LaFleur, I don't know what your thought process was there. If I'm a Green Bay fan, I'm so pissed. And I, I'd call him LaFraud because last year, 13-3, and they lost in the regular season to the 49ers, got embarrassed by them, then they lost in the championship game to the 49ers. This year, 13-3, and they lost to the Bucks, and they got embarrassed by the Bucks in the regular season. And then again, the playoffs, they lost to the Bucks. So, they're 26-6 and, and six over the last two seasons. And didn't make a Super Bowl. Yeah, and that's that's a huge thing. First, let's take, we have another call on how they feel about Aaron Rodgers and his comments after the game. Let's take that one. Just go, man. Sorry, I had to get a few more things off my chest about the Green Bay Packers and a few other things. You know, I mean, these Rodgers rumors that he's leaving, he's, I don't buy it as of now. Yeah, I'm here and he wants a pay raise, but, you know, for MVP caliber season, I mean, he's easily the MVP. Yeah, he should get a pay raise. But I also feel like Green Bay hasn't done anything to help him since they won the Super Bowl in 2010. That's over a decade ago. He's carried the franchise. Carry the organization, like, and they've done zero to help him out. I mean, he doesn't owe them anything. So would I be surprised if he left? No. Not at all. Honestly. He owes them nothing. It's just, I I, I just don't know, like, how you don't help a top five quarterback put weapons around him. Like, I, I don't know. They haven't won a Super Bowl since I was legally a, able to drink. I'm 32 now, so you do the math. You know, I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm going home to have a beer. I, I'll see you guys later. Till next week. Okay. My guy, Kesko Mac, back at it again with the hot takes. But. Let's be real, there's no chance he's leaving. Yeah, but I don't, that's the thing. I get what he's saying about, like, I understand why he'd be mad. I understand he would want to pay raise if he's not getting the help that he's getting. Like, you know what I mean? I agree, but I think people are making way too much out of these comments to begin with. All he said was, basically, in a nutshell, look, there are no absolutes in football. Everyone's job is in question every year. I don't care if you're Pat Mahomes. Your job could be in question. Because, ex- specific example, Pat Mahomes. Alex Smith was coming off an MVP caliber year, but they knew they had Pat Mahomes lined right up. Yeah, but I think Mahomes is like the one exception. I mean, I, I, I agree with your point wholeheartedly. I just think Pat Mahomes is the one guy that like you're just going to trust no matter what. 
No, but I get you. But everyone seems to forget now when Pat Mahomes was named the starter and they traded away Alex Smith, everyone was just like, what the fuck is Kansas City doing? I remember I told someone to, to like stash him, just like keep him on your draft board. And he took him like the 18th round or like something real late. And I was just like, yeah, like Andy Reid likes to pass, like keep an eye on him. No, literally. I picked him up after week two and then Renton won my league that year because yeah. he was just a free agent. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I understand what Matt's saying on our call that Aaron Rodgers obviously this year probably would have benefited from one of these rookie receivers that like Claypool and Justin Jefferson and, yeah. and Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, just the list goes on and on of all these great young receivers and they drafted Jordan Love who rode the bench very kindly. But... I think Aaron Rodgers is just frustrated. I think, you know, like, they've always had a team capable of getting to the Super Bowl. It's just they haven't done it. Speaking of going to the Super Bowl, this is going to be Brady's 10th time going to the Super Bowl. He's been in the NFC for one season, and he has one NFC championship. Drew Brees, one NFC championship. Aaron Rodgers, one NFC championship. Brady just like I also uh, think that's a little bit different of a scenario because a lot of people wanted to go play with Tom Brady, but you're finding out now that they didn't necessarily want to go play for Bill Belichick because they understand Bill Belichick is a great coach, fantastic, but it's a hard way of life. Yes. It's all work, no play. Well, it's all play because it's football. But yeah. But like even Gronk, he said, Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't there to be in the like the Patriots organization. So when he went to Tampa Bay, Tom was like, "Yo, we don't have to deal with we don't have to deal with Bill." And I don't think it's like negative between him and Gronk. It's just it's a hard way to live. You know what I mean? It's not fun. Yeah. Where I feel like the guys are just like, "Okay, we know Bruce Arians. We know how he is. He, like, yeah, you're gonna work." But Bruce Arians is kind of letting Brady run the offense, and I think that's why they've been so successful. But so a lot of guys went to. Tampa, who already had a stacked lineup, just a guy who couldn't not throw an interception. Yes. And you know what I mean? And then you add A.B. Then you add Gronk on the outside. Even though they don't use him as much, it's still a weapon. They add then Leonard they add Fournette. Leonard Fournette. And they have one of the best defenses in the league, if not the best defense in the league. Yeah. Adam Kinsu came over. Yeah. They, like, they, they did it right with they had the right pieces from the draft. They had drafted Godwin and Evans and Rojo and Levante David, but then they added in the right, you know, they brought in Brady. A lot of teams didn't want to take a gamble because he's 42, 43. They didn't want to take a gamble for the money. They brought in Gronk. Gronk took a season off. He retired. Like, you didn't know what you were going to get from him. They took some chances. They brought in Antonio Brown. We talked about that when he first came back, saying, like, this could go one of two ways. We were like, it's either going to click and they go to the Super Bowl, or it was going to blow up in their face. And it clicked, and then now here they are going to the Super Bowl. So. I, I got to give Tampa Bay a lot of credit. They they took gambles, and, you know, it worked. I'd also like to coin the phrase Champa Bay because you have the Stanley Cup champion. No, for real. Champa Bay Lightning. The American League was won by the Champa Bay Rays, and now you got the Champa Bay Buccaneers in the Super Bowl. I think there was another one around here somewhere. I don't know. Well, Miami went to the finals in basketball, and they're Florida, so I guess that kind of counts now. I feel nah. like I remembered something else, but. I mean, for Brady, Super Bowl number 10, that's, like, unbelievable. Just given the fact that there's only been 55 Super Bowls, he's been in 18% of them. This is also going to be the first ever home Super Bowl. Like, we're going to do a full Super Bowl dive next week for sure. But it's going to be very exciting to see the first time ever a team playing in their home field. At a time when you can't really have fans. Right. How fucking How ironic. Just, like, yeah. Would that be serendipity? Something like that? Uh, kind of. Maybe. Something like that. I don't know. One of those phrases. One of those words. I just, I don't know. I thought that was a, a great matchup. And, I mean, the Packers, you got to sign Aaron Jones. Do you have to? Like, no. Is he the guy you let go? I, if it was me, yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. It's fantastic. But running backs will always have a smaller vi- viability window. It's just the nature of the position. You're running headfirst into a group of five 300-pound men. Yeah. Like, that's going to take wear and tear on your body. I don't care who you are. Absolutely. 
So I think I think he'll hit the free agent market, and I think he will be a New York Jet. No, I I don't think they're gonna do that after the Lev Bell thing. That's yeah, but he's not Lev Bell. I understand, like I understand that, but I don't think I don't think Joe Douglas is gonna put that much money into a running back right now. That's fair. We got some Jets talk coming up about off season moves for them, but let's transition to the AFC, another AFC East team. Chris, you're not going through a table. You're safe. I'm not going through a table. <laughs> the tables, all tables across the Buffalo greater region can take a deep breath. The Buffalo Bills had a great season. Josh Allen, you are a great football player, but they are not going to the Super Bowl. It was a really great season. It really was. I feel like if they had like maybe like one or two more weapons. I feel like if like, they... Even, even not like... I'm not even saying like... They don't need another Stefan, but if they brought in, like, just someone on the other – if they brought in, like, a Robbie Anderson, let's say. I think they just need a running back. I think they just need some – I think that I think that would help, too. Aaron Jones. I think they just need a ground game to complement the pass game. That might be a good landing spot for him. That would be fun. I'm going to write about that. I think – I honestly think if the Bills were in the NFC, I think the Bills would have beaten the Packers. I think the Bills would have yeah. beaten the Bucks. I, I think agree. if the AFC Championship decided this – Who's going to be the champs? And as we saw, the Kansas City Chiefs are a really fucking good football team. Yeah. Patrick Mahomes is is incredible. Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey are equally incredible. Maybe not as incredible as Patrick Mahomes is, but and that I, trio, man. I honestly think that the Hardman fumble was probably the best thing that happened for them in that game. Because yeah. Hardman woke up after that. He was like, no, we're not losing this game because of me. He had the fumble. He set the Bills up at the, the seven-yard line, the six-yard line. I think it was like the two. Okay, that would be even, be even better. The Bills score right away, take a 9 nothing lead, and then Hardeman bounced back, hit the 50-yard run. He caught a touchdown. Yeah, he came back and had a game. He, he, yeah, it sparked a fire. Well, because I saw it after he fumbled. Right. Mahomes came up to him. and did Travis what, Kelsey, too. Yeah. The, they did what leaders do. That's what that's what you do when you lead a team. You come up and you say, "Hey, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days." You put your chin up. <laughs> they, they, no, they, that's what they did. That's that's what a team does. You no, literally, he went back to the bench, threw like one of those big jacket things over him to cover himself, and first thing Travis Kelsey does is walk up and go, "Nah, don't do that. Don't do that." Yeah. And then Pat comes over. It's just like, "Look, we did it. Now we're gonna get it back. Be us." That's what they did, and. Yeah, that just shows the unity this team has and how – and I think one distinct advantage between the Chiefs looking at these guys and looking at the Bucks, and we were just saying this pretty much, is that the Chiefs have pretty much the same roster or the same core players that they had last year, right? Mahomes, Kelsey, Hill, even Hardman, Watkins, the defense, Matthew, like all these guys were there last year, whereas with the Bucks, yeah, a lot of these guys are still, you know, new to the – organization obviously yeah. they've been playing together but a lot of ring chases antonio brown's been there for half the season you know uh gronk hasn't really been there so the, the way the chiefs are built is obviously much more sustainable like with the bucks this is their shot if yeah. the bucks don't get it this year maybe next year another year of brady but it's not gonna last yeah i think like our, our caller cole said and i mentioned this a couple weeks ago i think there's gonna be a very long run of kansas city dominance yeah i i mean how could you not think that I really think it's kind of sad for Tom Brady because he can't even get out of the league before his successor is going to take over for him. Because well, I really do believe that. That's the beauty of this. It's the GOAT versus the up-and-comer. It's the passing of the torch game. Yeah. But, like, that's the thing. For the longest time, we were just like, yeah, I don't think in our lifetime we're going to see someone who's going to go on a run like Tom Brady and do that. I think he's not even out of the league and the guy's already there. Yeah. and it. Uh, to answer Cole's question, I, I would not be surprised at all if the reason the enemy is staying with Kansas City is because Andy Reid said, look, I want to win three championships, three, four, cha- like three championships in five years, whatever it is, or, what, whatever his whatever his benchmark is for his ultimate goal. And then, yeah. Hey, Eric, the you want to be the coach of a team with Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and no, but even, Hill? even if it's not like, oh, I want to win three championships, he could have went up to be enemy. He's just like, look. I got another three years in me. Hold out, and it's yours. Yeah. 
And if you're the enemy, of course you're going to take that. There's no better spot in the league. Yeah. He's going to stack up another probably at least two championships in those next three years and then put himself in prime position to win even more right? And as head coach. That begs my question. Are we going to reach the point, maybe not anytime soon, maybe it's 2025, where we're going to all be like, I fucking hate the Chiefs. They win every year. The way people turned on the Warriors because they were always winning. The way an entire generation hates the Yankees for always winning. I disagree. I wouldn't. I don't feel like I would at the very least because I like seeing the Warriors. I'm obviously a Yankee fan, so that makes me a little biased there. But Valid. like, I liked it when the Warriors were going on that run. I I thought it was so much fun. Like, What about the Miami Heat when it was LeBron? They won four yeah. straight finals. You like, I mean, but I'm just saying like that they became the enemies. They became the bad guys because they were just so, so much better that it was like, I mean, the Chiefs, the Chiefs went fourteen and two. They've won their two playoff games. The one, the the loss they had against the Chargers doesn't really count because nobody played. Like, and then the I think it was the Colts snuck one. No, the the Raiders. Raiders, I mean, John, yeah. John Gruden somehow, of all people, Patrick Mahomes has won like twenty of the last twenty three football games. He's twenty of the last twenty one games he's played in, and yet. John Gruden's that one. Yeah, but... Go figure. You have to remember, the beginning of this season was very sloppy for everyone because no one had really any time to prepare the way they normally would. Right. So it was a little... Everyone everyone was a little off. A lot of weird things happened in that first week. Yeah, and I think that's why, for the players at least, that this this Super Bowl is going to be different because there's not going to be the media week. There's not going to be the, the fan frenzy and all that stuff. So I think for a lot of these players, it's going to be a lot a lot easier for them to focus on the game. Yeah. Like, Brady obviously has done this for now the 10th time going into Super Bowl, but we, spot, we said Le'Veon Bell before. We talked about Antonio Brown. These are guys who were with the Steelers, and they didn't make it, but now here they are. These are, you know, a lot of these guys, especially with the Bucks, obviously have never been there before. Um, they, they don't have these distractions that normally come with the Super Bowl. They, they're obviously going to have a lot more spotlights on them because it's the Super Bowl, and we're going to dive into all the strange storylines probably probably next week, but, you know, everybody's going to nitpick all the smallest things of, like, you know, I'm sure we'll hear stories of, like, Scotty Miller grew up on a street that was had the same name as Tyreek Hill Street when he grew up. Like, you know, all these, like, random connections that don't make sense. Also, speaking, speaking real quick, shout to Dev. Fucking Scotty Miller Scotty fucking Miller. went off. Scotty doesn't know. <laughs> he called that shit from a mile away. <laughs> That was the play. Yeah, we should have talked about that because that play really broke the backs of the Packers. Uh, oh, yeah. That was the play. Like, you go into halftime, 14-10, you're at home, you can turn things around. You let up a touchdown like that where it's a small white guy just screaming, you know, I'm open, oh. just screaming, <laughs> throw me the ball, and he's just out. And then, then you go down 21-10. to 10. That's huge. I know. He just, that just text us in the group chat doesn't say anything about the player just go scotty fucking miller <laughs> i think i'm gonna probably throw like two dollars on him to win super bowl mvp scotty miller <laughs> and, i'm sure it's probably like plus you know 17 million <laughs> yeah it's probably like two dollars to win you know 200 so why not who knows who knows weird things happen i mean I don't. You probably couldn't get odds on that. Like, oh no, he's definitely on the list, dude. I was looking at some of the prop bets. That's another thing. I'm gonna make a, a full list coming up next week. It's gonna be a full list of the best prop bets. I'm sending you some. You got the Gatorade color. We're all doing the Gatorade color. You gotta pick what color Gatorade they pour on the winning coach. Oh who who the MVP thinks first? Usually it's either Jesus. Dude, the fact that you can bet on the fucking puppy bowl is fucking mind blowing to me. See, to me that's kind of concerning because I feel like that's the easiest one to rig. Yeah. Like, you just put a little bit more in his bowl, put a little bit more in her bowl. Like, you can manipulate that one. Um, I'm betting on the weekend to, to fuck up at some point. I think he will curse or just do some something that's going to be problematic. I'm not going to bet. You can bet on, like, if Eric Church fucks up the national anthem, which, like, you know, if, he, if you're a country singer and you get the national anthem, like, even the smallest bit wrong, it's over. You're done. Your career's yeah, over. that's so not good. That's not happening. You can bet on, like, what songs they do. You can bet on who wins and then what's going to happen to the price of Bitcoin in relation to their win. What? <laughs> yeah, all sorts of weird. Like, you could Yo. literally be like, Chiefs win, Bitcoin goes up. Chiefs win, Bitcoin goes down. Yo, okay. So, I like gambling here and there. I don't play a lot of money. Like, I'm not a huge gambler, but I like it. Like, I have some fun with it here or there. Like, especially if there's, like, a fight card that's not super great. I'll throw some money on there. Actual gambler gamblers are fucking 
degenerate fucking people. Like, holy fuck. The, f- the things I'm seeing pop up that you can bet on is absolutely ridiculous. Like, y'all have a problem if you're betting on... Like, I think y'all have a problem if you're betting on whether the coin toss is going to be heads or tails. Yeah, but the, but the fact that you can bet on the fucking puppy bowl or you can fucking dude, bet that, on what the, color Gatorade, like, go. That's, oh, the, that's fu- the light stuff, dude. We're talking over-unders for the Star Spangled Banner for the National Anthem because they actually... People time it. People know. People literally know. You could bet what commercials come up. Who's going to be the first commercial? Pepsi, Mountain, uh, Pepsi, Coke, Mountain Dew. Like, those are the classic ones. You never know. I'm excited for Super Bowl commercials. Yeah, everyone likes Super Bowl commercials, but the fact that you can bet on them is fucking ridiculous. You can bet on anything. It's beautiful. It's ridiculous. It's dangerous, but it's beautiful. Very dangerous. Gamble responsibly if you have a problem. Call yes. 1-800-GAMBLING. You you had that a little bit just, too... Just too gotta, you had that a little bit too much just out of your pocket there, bud. You got, it's one of those things that's like... So many people say it to me. It's weird to say it to someone else, you know? Okay, so see, the thing is, <laughs> Eric. Never a podcast. I'm here for an event. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for those of you watching, I, I don't bet more than, like, $5 at a time. Like, it's really not that serious. It's just for fun. He just bets $5 a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to diversify your portfolio. <laughs> no, he's not bad. I'm just fucking with him. Yeah, no. So... Uh, there's going to be a lot a lot we could talk about next week with the Super Bowl. We had to get over we had to we had to dive deep into Connor and, and the UFC so we didn't want to take up all the time with the Super Bowl. Hey, 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 I fucking got a fight episode. Fuck y'all. <laughs> I'm very excited for the Super Bowl because Oh yeah. I just think you have the two living legends. I mean Yeah, but I feel like everyone's trying to beat these things to death right now. Let's wait a little bit till it's actually Yeah, listen, on. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think we're going to take I'm going to take this weekend to see what storylines aren't getting attention. Right. And we're going to talk about that. All right. Uh, the other football news, there's some football news that's good things, some football news that's not good things. Uh, we got the quarterback carousel going in motion. Deshaun Watson officially requested a trade from the Texans. Yeah. The Detroit Lions announced that they're parting ways with Matt Stafford. So you got, you know, a wily vet and Stafford on the move. You got Deshaun Watson saying he wants to come to our New York Jets with his... What the fuck? I went on a whole huge rant on this on the show that there's no way this guy's ever going to want to come here. Yeah, And nah, he's it's... like, yo, fucking Jets, sign me up. He's like, wait, wait, wait. Chris said what? All right, I got to prove him wrong real quick. But that's how you know that things are terrible in Houston when your star players are looking at the Jets like, yeah, that's actually... Yo, that- that seems that's like a great I, idea. Yeah, that's where I want to go. <laughs> I want to spend my free time in New Jersey. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, th- I mean, we got to give up everything. Like, I'm fine yeah. giving up as many picks as they want. Because, like I said, I I've, th- I've said before, like, you hope, best case, best case, J- uh, Justin Fields or Zach Wilson, whoever the next best quarterback is behind Lawrence, ends up being almost as good as Watson. But, see, that's the thing. If they don't go down the Watson trade, like the Watson route, or like maybe go after Stafford, or maybe like you know someone who's a little more established, just keep Sam at that point. No. These like honestly, like Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, uh, Mac Jones, all these guys. No one's really shown me like if it was Trevor Lawrence, take him all day. The rest of them, I feel like we're just doing the same thing we did with Sam. Yes, I completely agree. You're taking a gamble. That's what it, that's literally what it comes down to is that you hope that with the right system, the right personnel, that they become something. And what we've seen with Watson is you had Desha- you had DeAndre Hopkins get traded without him knowing, and he was pissed. But this past season, he led the league in passing yards with his best receiver being Will Fuller, who got suspended for that second half for the last six games, and, and then Brandon Brandon Cooks. Cooks, who is a great receiver, but yeah. you know he's a little older now. He's not where he was. When he had his best years. Watson showed that when you have shitty coaches like Bill O'Brien, he can still make it work. When you have, you know, very limited resources in terms of weapons, he can still make it work. He's proven that he is that guy. And I like And going in with Robert Sala, who everyone agrees is gonna be a great head coach, you now have Joe Douglas who has I make the point all the time for the people who aren't sold on Joe Douglas quite yet, because I'm very sold on Joe Douglas, if you guys haven't been able to tell. Look at where the Eagles were the last year he was with them. 
and look at where the Eagles are. Did he sign Wentz to the extension? I don't know. If he signed Wentz to the extension, I'm I got a couple of couple but of see, questions. No, but see that's the thing. He signed him to the extension. F. Well, he's not. He wasn't. He was never the GM. So that was the GM's fault. He was just part of the scouting department for them. He's like the head scouter of saying who's good, who's not, who we should pick up, who we shouldn't. Okay, he's a talent guy. And he got, he got them all the right weapons to go and win the Super Bowl. Then he left, took the GM job. And that team has no one good on it anymore. Yeah. They just aged out all the players he took, and the players they've added since have not done anything. And they, well... They've added a head coach since uh, we last spoke. They, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Nick Sirianni, I, I believe. Nope. I think he was, the offensive, he was the offensive coordinator for the Colts, former quarterback coach. And I was saying I thought Carson Wentz was going to go to the Colts, but it looks like they're bringing the Colts to Carson Wentz. So I think Wentz is going to stay with the Eagles. I think Colts take Stafford. You think Stafford to the Colts? I could see Stafford to the Colts. That would be, I think that would work really well. Uh, yeah, you I think that would be. You got a good running game. You got a good defense. I think, I think T.Y. is free agent. Uh, and I wouldn't pay him to come back. Either either way, I still think I could see Stafford going to the Colts. I could see Stafford going to the Patriots. I think that's something Belichick would take a chance on. I think I think Belichick would take a chance on that, but I I don't just it, this is more of a gut feeling than anything I'm basing it on statistically. I just feel like the Colts are a better fit for him. I feel that Stafford. I don't know if he has no trade clause. I think he wants to go to a situation where he's going to be ready to win, and I could see yeah. him going to the 49ers. I could see him. I going, think that would be another great fit. I could him. see him going to the Washington Football Team because their GM was the Lions GM when they drafted him. So I could see him going if he goes to the 49ers, or if he goes to either the 49ers or the Washington Football Team. I really want to say Redskins, but I'm trying so hard not to say Redskins. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got two great defenses. They have good receivers. Like they both need quarterbacks. They're obviously going to be in contention for Sean Deshaun Watson. I think I think almost every team is gonna have a conversation about Deshaun Watson. I think like obviously the Packers with Rodgers, Chiefs with Mahomes, at least for another year of Brady, Tampa Bay, those are teams that probably I mean the Josh Allen, the Bills, those are teams that know who their quarterback's gonna be for the next yeah, foreseeable but, future. But you have to like we're talking about this as like uh quarterback carousel, like blah 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 blah. We have to understand it. 18 out of the 32 quarterbacks could be moving this year, have the, have the potential to be moved this year. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, one of those is Aaron Rodgers, so you can take that out, in my opinion. Because, like, again, I think he was just saying, look, there are no absolutes in this sport. No one knows what's going to happen to anyone tomorrow. Like, yeah, does he believe he's probably out of Green Bay? No. But he could get hurt tomorrow. He could get hit by a bus. Like, you don't know. Jesus Christ. Christ, let's hope he doesn't get hit by a yeah. bus because then it's on you. Fucking Aaron let's Rodgers, not put please don't get universe. hit by a bus. I like, I, I actually, I actually, I think this Pat McAfee show thing he does every week now is the best thing he's ever done for his career because he's just a very likable person. Yeah, it makes him so much more of a human being than just like the State Farm guy. And he's not, it's not even just like human, like yeah, it humanizes him. But, like, he's just a very likable guy. He's just laid back. He's funny. He's just joking around with the boys. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's nothing. Like, I think Tom Brady does that same interview. Yeah, it'll get the same amount of play and same amount of traction. And it'll probably humanize Tom Brady a little bit, too. But I don't, like, his personality resonates well with people. Aaron Rodgers. Okay. Yeah, I see that. I I mean, Brady seems a little more robotic, but that could just be the Belichick way. Right. And uh, I like that a lot of people now are talking about, like, what did the Patriots do? Are they fucked because Brady left and it was all Brady the whole time? But I, I still think if Belichick can get Stafford, if Belichick can get, I mean, if, obviously if he can get Watson, that there, there'll be a wagon. But I think if he can get a decent quarterback in there, because I love Cam. I, Cam was great to watch. Cam didn't have it. Just Cam just didn't have it. Yeah. I think if you can get a good quarterback in there, they'll be fine because you got to remember they they had the most opt outs of any pl- any team for COVID reasons. They had they went from twenty years of Brady being the best pocket passer in the NFL to going to Cam Newton, who literally just didn't have an arm. Right. So that's a huge change. They didn't have any receivers, and they still went seven and nine. I just, just they'll be back. W- no, I 
I agree that Belichick there, they'll be okay. But I think the dynasty's done. I think the six. Yeah. I think the six rings was Brady. You know what I mean? Not all Brady. Obviously, the coaching had something to do with it. You know what I mean? There were some years he had decent teams, like even though like he couldn't win with Randy Moss, which is fucking incredible. Yeah, the Giants and the Eli Manning. That was just wild. But... Dude, still best times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not even a Giants fan. I bought a Giants Super Bowl championship. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, t-shirt afterwards. I went to the Giants parade after that. I skipped school with my friends. We all went down wearing Eli jerseys and stuff. It was crazy. Um, but I think I think Belichick will be back in the mix of things. Don't get me wrong. Sooner I, than we think. I still put him as one of the top coaches, if not the top coach, to ever do it. Like you know what I mean. I'm not trying to. As much as I fucking hate Bill Belichick, and we've been through that all before. Stupid coffee table napkin bullshit. Um. He. I think they don't get to six. They don't win six Super Bowls and get to nine without Tom Brady. But I don't think Tom Brady is Tom Brady without Belichick. Like we talk about how Adam Gase completely ruins every quarterback he he comes in contact with. Belichick, Belichick taught Brady how to read a defense. No, like okay, there was a reason he was a sixth round pick. No, yes, I agree. I agree to a point of the developmental side. Belichick played a heavy, heavy hand on. But I'm saying like. After say two thousand nine, if he, if something happens and they had a falling out in two thousand nine, and he gets moved to some other team, I don't think the Patriots. I think it depends who replaces him, because we saw that they didn't have the pocket passer to fit what their system is. If they were in the same offense that they ran with Tom Brady with a quarterback that wasn't Cam Newton, if they ran it with Matt Stafford, who knows? I think they'd be better if they had somebody who could throw the ball. I think if Belichick, I mean, because there were years, there was years like two years ago, Brady wasn't having a good season, but they had the top defense in the league, and they still won the division easily. Like, right. when they beat the Rams in the Super Bowl, they scored 13 points. It wasn't Brady balling out, but the defense held the Rams offense to three points. Yeah, but you, like, we make Edelman out to be, like, this super stud receiver. I feel like that was Brady making him that super stud receiver. He just did what Brady liked. You know I agree, I mean? but I think that's also Belichick coaching him into being a better player than he was. No, because I agree. we saw Wes Welker on. Wes Welker had a career bef- before he was the Patriot, and he just wasn't that good. I agree. I'm not saying. I'm not saying Belichick doesn't have a profound effect on it, but I think if you switch Tom Brady for Drew Brees in 2009, I don't. I still don't think you get to do as many Super Bowls. 2009 was the year Brees won. You know, I'm saying, I'm saying, just because I said 2009 before, I don't, okay. I don't think, you know what I mean. No, I just so agree. even even at 2010, if you swap them while they were both still in their primes, both still everything, I think Brady's just game IQ is just that so much next level compared to everyone else. If you get what I'm saying. Yeah, but I, honestly, I disagree. I think if if Breeze was the quarterback for the Patriots those years, I think they still would have won the Super Bowl. I think the Bucks. I mean, I think the Saints would have been better with Brady, but. I mean that's a I mean that's a whole other debate by what whether Breeze is better than Brady and the whole system thing, but right, it'll be interesting to see the Super Bowl without. Yeah, but Belichick. I think you can definitely put the bed after this year that Brady was a system quarterback. It was just Bill's system that made Brady like this. No, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Like <laughs> I think the but with the right quarterback, especially with this quarterback carousel with the quarterbacks in the draft, and I'm not saying I, I just think the Patriots are going to be back in the fold a lot quicker than we think. The Bills are going to be good for a while. The Dolphins have a great defense, and I mean, Tua might not be the guy, but if they can, if the Jets don't get Watson and Watson goes to the Dolphins, I can see the Dolphins, Bills, and Patriots being a lot better than the Jets for a long time. Bro, all of a, if that happens, all of a sudden the AFC goes from like probably the worst division in the AFC for the last few years, other than the Patriots, to the best division in probably all of football. Yeah, and we won't be. Very happy about it because it's going to be. Dead. we'll still be fucking four and twelve. <laughs> All right, let's see. That's depressing. <laughs> On that note, let's go into some l- more depressing football news. Um, Chad Wheeler. Chad Wheeler. Offensive lineman for the Seattle Seahawks. I don't think he was even a starter. Stupid. Yeah. Not even just stupid. This is this is a monstrous act. Everyone like Ray. Ray Rice was trending. Bree Punt was trending. So for those who don't know, Chad Wheeler uh, 
just beat the sh- living shit out of his girlfriend. Choked her till she thought she was dead. Choked her unconscious, bloody nose, broken nose, black eyes. Just, just left her, literally left her for dead. And he thought he killed her. Uh, and then when she walks out of the room after regaining consciousness, because he choked her unconscious, and runs into the bathroom, locks herself in. All he does is go. Apparently, he's sipping a smoothie and goes, "Oh, you're alive." Yeah. That's some fucking serial killer that's shit. Some, yeah, it's dark. That's some horror movie dark shit. The, he put out a statement saying it was a manic episode on Twitter, and he's, you know, going to check himself and to get help. But this is one of those things where the NFL, we've seen this happen with several players, and they took some strong stances. A lot of people, like you said online, were comparing it to Ray Rice, Kareem Hunt. Uh, I mean, I honestly don't think that's even comparable. This was attempted murder. Th- this was very much attempted murder. And look, I have my own mental health problems. I don't know about you. But we're both very pro mental health people. Like, talk about your depression. Talk about your anxiety. Talk about, like, we need to have these conversations to absolutely help people get better. So we're not trying to say, oh, like, fuck that, fuck that mental health thing. But there's a difference here. There's mental health. There's manic episodes, and I get it. I've dealt with people who've had manic episodes, like, it's a crazy thing. But you're not manic when you're calmly eating dinner, sipping a smoothie, thinking your girlfriend just died. You're not manic calmly doing that. See, she walks out and going, oh, you're alive. That's cool. I agree. It and is not the same thing. I mean, he's going to check himself into a mental health facility. But to me, to it should be, you know, arrested. He should be prosecuted criminally he should get the help he needs absolutely yeah but there's got to be a criminal charge in there he attempted murder uh the nfl was very strong on making sure ray rice didn't have a career after his you know domestic assault uh be very shocked to see chad wheeler play football ever again yeah and that's the thing like i don't want to like compare because to the woman that kareem hunt did his things to that was a terrible moment, so I don't want to be like, oh, this is so much bigger than Kareem Hunt, blah, 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 But it really is just different, you know what I mean? Not to take away from what Kareem Hunt did. That was a monstrous act as well. Like, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to compare traumas here. But just... There's, there's levels to everything, you know what I mean? Like... This is just so much darker than anything i've ever seen this is like aaron hernandez like yeah like it's you know like oj simpson vein of literal murder and i don't know how the nfl is gonna respond to this react to this but i just i mean it just needs to be addressed that you can't use mental health as a scapegoat for this kind of thing and i'm not saying that he doesn't have mental health issues yeah it's very possible it's very possible he has cte it's very possible you know a ton of factors but the reality is this woman was within seconds of losing her life. We are not trying to in any way downplay mental health and its effect on people. But you also have to take responsibility for your actions. Again, I have my own mental health problems. I have depression. I have anxiety. I have all these things. And sometimes, like, I get into my depression mode or I'm anxious and, and I say or do stupid things but that's still on me whether or not it might be a manifestation from my depression from my anxiety it might be because I'm having a panic attack it might be because this or that it still happened right you can't use mental health as a hey man is like is a manic episode it's like sorry yeah. there's a difference between like Oh, I I didn't, you know, I didn't do my homework because I was just feeling depressed and didn't, you know, didn't want to do my homework. That's that's I get that. Yeah. It's not I was manic and tried to kill my girlfriend. Right. That's different. You have to own that and But you know what? You know, I I was that guy too where I had trouble like doing that type of stuff because of my depression and all that. But you know what? At the end of the day, where yeah, this was it was a manifestation of my symptoms, but I wasn't doing the correct things to con- 
to try to help myself control those symptoms and I was feeding in to my things. If you're not doing all the things correctly to get yourself help, you can't just blame it on the mental illness because you know what it's going to take to get where you want to be or where you want to try to be. It's not as black and white like that. I understand. But I personally, there have been times where I haven't been doing the right things to keep my mental health in check. And it's led to some things. That's my fault. I need to own that. Same way he needs to own that. Obviously, it's apples and oranges because my shit is I called out for work too much or I didn't do my homework or stuff like that. And this is fucking murder. But just. Well said. But you need to. You need to. He should have been proactively doing the things to help himself. If he knew this is, if he knew he was, I think it was bipolar or what it was. Right. I mean, going forward, it sounds like he's going to get the help he needs. Uh, I think we're all just really thankful that she is alive. I mean, he's he's an offensive lineman. He's like 6'4", 300 pounds. He's a massive human being. He very, very much so could have ended her life with his bare hands right there. So let's just hope she has a, a speedy, full recovery. Yeah. Just, like, I'm, I'm not a super religious man myself, but prayers up thoughts all that good stuff to her and her family like we're here with you obviously there's probably not much we can do but if there is let us know we'll yeah do it. yeah like we want nothing but the best for her and her family and we're strong advocates for mental health and chad wheeler should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law yeah that summarizes that <sighs> okay so let's get into some weird news still not still not necessarily great news but way less depressing yeah a, li- a way more fun to talk about <laughs> turn it up a little bit um so the hall of fame voting for major league baseball occurred this week with zero zero hall of famers being voted in baseball writers have decided that barry bonds roger clemens mark mcguire kurt schilling so on and so forth are still not worthy of the hall of fame I mean, this is a debate that's going to rage on because I have thoughts, you have thoughts. I think baseball writers take themselves way too serious. Tom Verducci put out a six-minute, like, video where he's quoting Winston Churchill and saying, like, the immense power that comes with this. Uh, uh, uh. You're, you're, you're just your guy. You're getting paid to write yeah. sports. Like, chill out. Also, I think a big factor in this that a lot of people aren't playing in for why they felt okay to not induct anyone this year is they're still going to have a ceremony because they didn't have one for the 2020 class. So Jeter's still going to get up there and accept his, like, his, what is it, like a gold jacket? What is I think it's a gold jacket and a plaque. Yeah. So he's going to go up there. He's going to get his gold jacket. He's going to get his plaque. They're still going to be able to do that. Are they going to do it on Zoom? That's going to be so anticlimactic. Um, I don't think they're going to do it on Zoom because, like, they've kind of figured out these types of things where it's small like I don't yeah. there might not be people in the like there might not be a crowd no I'm sure they'll figure something out I don't know it's gonna be it's one of those things that it's gonna be a debate anybody's gonna have a different opinion on whether or not you could let these steroid error players in statistically Barry Bonds was the best player of all time right like the guy would literally get 180 intentional walks a season still hit 40 home runs granted he was on steroids like I that that debate you could have there's the other debate. Uh, no, but th- I think it's I think it's a lot deeper than that because I've been hearing some pundits bring like bring up some really good points. First of all, with the steroid user thing, you know Clemens, you know Bonds, you know McGuire, blah 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 blah. Everyone knows the big names, but in this era, it wasn't illegal. It in the '90s at the very least. L- later, when they were using part of it too, but some of these guys, it wasn't. It wasn't against the rules for baseball. It might have been illegal in the U.S., but it wasn't against the rules for baseball. Right. It might have been unethical. It might not have been what you wanted. It's the integrity of the game. Right. No, I completely understand that. But do you think Babe Ruth was drinking protein shakes? No, Babe Ruth was drinking beers and smoking cigars, but he wasn't. He clearly wasn't on steroids. If you ever saw a picture of him, he was no. But that's but but that's dude. what I'm that's what I'm saying. Like. 
these, first of all, these guys were just using the technology that was available to them, at least like the 90s era guys. Obviously, later down the line, it becomes a little more nefarious. But also at the same time, we know the big names. We talk about these things. Pretty much everyone in the league was doing it at that time. I know that's a broad statement, but like it was not an uncommon thing. But that doesn't make it okay. I understand, but you're playing, it's steroid players playing against steroid players. Like, yeah, but I mean, yes and no, because to, to an extent where it's like, Roger Clemens had a Hall of Fame career before he started taking steroids. Barry Bonds had a Hall of Fame career. Mark McGuire, these guys would have been Hall of Famers before they started juicing. It's just they added an extra seven to ten years of dominance to their careers by taking steroids. Barry Bonds was 40 years old when he hit 70 home runs. Like, Clemens won a Cy Young over the age of 40. These guys just got better with age in a most unnatural way. And to me, that's unfair. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. But you also have to understand, Bonds is is a great case study for this. His head got huge. Because he was the best player in baseball before he started taking steroids. But no one gave a shit. All they came, all they cared about was Sosa McGuire, who was going to break the record. Because they were both on steroids. Right. So he's, but this was before Bonds was on steroids. So Bonds sees that. He's like, look, I'm the best fucking player in baseball. But these guys are getting all the shine because they're big muscle heads. Like, he also if everyone in, else is doing it, fuck it. Yeah, he was in, well, he was also San Francisco with the Balco scandal happened. So he had easy access. I see what you're saying. I just think, you know. I think you let them in. But just put on their bus being like, hey, he was not even an asterisk. Just be like, hey, this guy was playing baseball in the steroid era. This is what these guys were doing back then. We can't, you can't, I think, I think um, Bart Scott said it perfectly on uh, his show that I heard. He said, you cannot tell the story of baseball without Mark McGuire. You can't tell the story of baseball without Barry Bonds. You can't tell the story of baseball without Sammy Sosa. Like, you can't you can't do it. It's but not then, possible. But then do you follow up and say, well, since then, Clemens has gotten in legal trouble because he, the steroids he bought were illegal, and he literally blamed his wife for it. Since then, Sammy Sosa has undergone incredible health issues, such as jaundice of the skin, where he's now like a yellowish color like do you not go into the fact that like barry bonds is alienated like the the san francisco giants don't invite him to things because he cheated the game right no and like yes you explain this like you need these guys to tell the story of baseball tell the full story though well then you got to go all the way back and tell the story of how black players were allowed when baseball first started in the 1860s 1870s and then the players came around and said no we got to kick the blacks out i agree Tell the whole story. Well, that's the see to me. That's the thing of the next issue that I was going to say is with Kurt Schilling, where Kurt Schilling isn't necessarily a steroid user. He played at that time, like you said. There were people who did play at that time that didn't take steroids. He was dominant. He won a World Series in two thousand one with the Diamondbacks, two thousand four with the Red Sox, two thousand seven with the Red Sox. He always finished second in the Cy Young because Randy Johnson and Pedro Martinez. That's just a tough break. Yeah. Kurt Schilling, based on. The merit, and this is a conversation I had with my friend Cole, be, uh, who called in. Based on, based on baseball, Kurt Schilling, probably right at the cusp where you could say he's a Hall of Famer. But because Kurt Schilling has very strong, very eccentric political beliefs and has tweeted some very, uh, what's the word, very fucked up things, you know, like he's kind of an asshole. So yeah. he's, he's, getting, he's getting left out because he has political views that, don't most people don't agree with. He's said some things that's really stupid about the media, which, you know, first first of all, you don't fuck with the people who make your food and you don't fuck with the people who vote them for you in the, the Hall of Fame. Fame. You know, like like yeah. You're not gonna you're not gonna say fuck every every baseball writer and then expect them to vote for you in the Hall of Fame. Kurt, you're just an No, he literally one. says he literally called for people to hang journalists. <laughs> like yeah, you, you don't do that and then expect them to come to you. But this goes from the broader picture of things. Are you basing these guys all as baseball players? Or what they did off the field. Because Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens on the baseball field were insanely dominant. Off the field, they cheated to get that good. Whereas right. Kurt Schilling, on the field, great baseball player, bloody sock, break the curse, all of that. Off the field, I guess he's an asshole. Because then you look back and you're like, okay, what about Ty Cobb? Ty Cobb was spiking people. Like, literally sliding in with his spikes up. And has we've learned 
they knew it was going on back then, but it's kind of come to light over the past like five, ten years that he was a complete racist and bigot. Well, most of them were in the twenties, yeah. right? But like he was apparently like extra, uh, extra, I extra. Mean, <laughs> Cap Anson's like the guy who made the Cubs relevant the nineteen hundreds, like, right? And they, he's in the Hall of Fame, and he's the guy who literally like made it a rule in baseball: no blacks. Like he's yeah. in the Hall of Fame. So I mean. It depends on where you want to draw the line between baseball player and asshole. Right. My, what I believe is, my belief is the way they handle it is the journalists focus on stats and outside. But then, like Kurt Schilling's even said, when it gets to the, the what's that next? Like the players voting, like the... the Player vote? After this next year, his last year of eligibility for the writers vote. Right. So next, it's it goes on to all former players, and they basically vote on it directly on a stat line. I'm gonna be perfectly honest. The players should be the ones voting. I don't yeah. see why baseball writers have any say in it. Right. No, I agree. It's the same thing with like the MMA, like pound for pound rankings, or just any type of rankings, like. Well, rankings I get because it's arbitrary and it can change week to week, and they're guys who see it. But, like, Hall of Fame, you get put in the Hall of Fame, you're in the Hall of Fame. Right. Or you're Pete Rose and you're banned from the Hall of Fame, and right. you're not in the Hall of Fame. Pete and Rose is another thing where baseball now has a partnership with DraftKings. Baseball is literally doing hundreds of millions of dollars with a gambling company, but won't let Pete Rose in for gambling. Yeah, and it's not like he was like Black Sox where he was betting against his team. He was just betting on himself to win or betting on games that had nothing to do with him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that I have no problem with. And they let Pete Rose do games for MLB Network. So Right. It's, I literally it's, have zero problem with that. And going back to these writers, why it shouldn't be the writers voting, these writers literally all made their careers by writing about, like you said, consi- uh, the home run chase between Sosa and McGuire, yeah. writing about Barry Bonds and 73 home runs, writing about Roger Clemens. And by the way, Uncle Richie, predicted of Clemens as it was happening because Clemens used to take the first month or two of the season off, right? He was retired, and then he'd come back. And Uncle Richie did say, he's probably taking steroids and letting it flush out of his system so he doesn't get positive tests and he doesn't get caught with it. But regardless, the writers made their careers off these guys taking steroids, and now they're going to be the ones punishing these guys for taking steroids. Yeah. No, I, I, I 100% agree. I think you let them in, and but just explain the story. You know what I mean? Because they are integral to the game. I don't like it. But uh, this also leads me to another point I've been hearing from the pundits. If you're going to take the stance that no Bonds, no Maguire, no Clemens, no Sammy Sosa, whatever, like any of the steroid guys, because it's cheating, right? It's the integrity of the game. What do you do with Altuve? No, none of them get in. I, I, I... To me, that's the craziest part about this whole, the pandemic shortened season is that we completely stopped talking about the Astros cheating scandal. Like Springer is going to the Blue Jays to Toronto. They're probably going to play in Buffalo this year, but he's leaving and it's just like all is forgotten. Like, yeah, I, are you going to hit him when he comes up? And now they're even saying, now they're even saying it goes deeper than that, where the pitchers might have been having a little concoction to put on the ball to increase their spin rate. I heard about that Garrett Cole, right? Well, yeah, but that's why that's why uh Verlander before he got to the Astros, every you have to remember, before he got to the Astros, everyone was just like, "Why would the Astros fucking sign this guy?" No, nah, Verlander just didn't care cuz Detroit was terrible. He no, came out I, and said that. I know, but like he was he was not playing good baseball. Yeah, but he came out and said like he wasn't working out as hard, he wasn't training with the team as much as he could because they Yeah, but if you're cheating, you're going to give Extra reasons for if you're going from I see not great to Cy Young in one year when you're that old. I see what you're saying. You're gonna have to figure out a reason. You I, know what I mean? Yeah. It's not gonna go unnoticed. But I, I honestly would not be surprised if down the line we look back at that Astros championship and there is some sort of asterisk next to it, or at least in the minds of baseball fans, it's a sham World Series. Yeah, but so it's very hard to draw if, the line. If Altuve and Correa and these guys who have the potential to have Hall of Fame careers, from what we've seen, if they go for the rest of their career, never win another championship, never have another season like that, do you 
None of them will make the Hall of Fame. None of them get to the Hall? None of them are going to get in. I, I, if, I, if I, that, don't, if, I don't agree. I think the way it is now, those guys will still get in. If you look at El Tuve's year this last year compared to when he was getting the, the buzzers or whatever, right? he had a huge fall off. And if these baseball if these baseball writers who literally, you know, they fawned over everything Bonds McGuire did, every time Bonds sneezed, there was on ESPN, they literally yeah. would cut from games to go to Bonds' at-bats. Yeah. If they're not going to vote for those guys, then they're definitely not voting for these Astros. I guarantee it. Because Bonds had like 20 years of dominance. But you- McGuire had... McGuire had like MVP seasons with Oakland before he even knew what steroids were. But you also have to remember the old saying in baseball: if you're not cheating, you're not trying. I mean, that's a saying in everything. I mean, I I did that. I in know, my math but that tests. that's that's very extra in baseball. That's like a mantra there. Yeah, but that's like a social studies, like a high school social studies test. You're like, what'd you get for B? What'd you get? What'd you get? Like, you know what I mean? Like, everybody cheats at everything. No, but I'm saying like in baseball, that's always been a mantra going for them. Like, if you're not, like. I'm not saying cheating to the level, like, as sophisticated as they got it, but I you've think... always had guys who, like, had something on the rim of their head. You've always had guys who had this, that, or the third, and it just gets washed away. But there's, I mean, there's, like, difference between a, a little, like, I get it, yes, having pine tar have, helps your back grip, and, and having the little rosin bags help, or whatever spit, or whatever you're using. You get, you, you get getting... guys, you see guys get caught with corked bats all the time. Right, but I'm saying, okay, yes, the perfect example. A corked bat makes the bat a little bit heavier. Gives you a little added power to your swing. Taking steroids and manufacturing 20 pounds of muscle in like two months. That's the same thing. But it gives you a lot more of it. And it improves your muscle uh, reaction speed, which makes you a better hitter. I understand. I don't know. I think there should just be a hall of fame for steroid users across all sports. I, I, like I said, I think you let them in, but just tell the story. If you're listening to this, I want you to let us know your thoughts. Steroid users should get in. Steroid users should not get in. There should be an asterisk. What you would do, just call us. You know the phone number. It's going to be on the screen right here or there or there. (laughs) We'll figure it out. (laughs) Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Let us know your thoughts because this is a debate that we're going to have every year when it comes to the Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, for for the rest of time, as long as they keep letting the news writers do it. Because if it was the players being like, no, they cheated, fuck them. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm with it. I respect it. But I think the debate rallies on so hard. It's because of who is making this thing. Like, and you also, like, people also kind of pick and choose with steroids. Because, like, we were talking about it before the show. We are talking about that. Are we going to talk about how Lawrence Taylor was doing bumps of cocaine on the side of the, the field to get himself amped up to go in? You think that's not performance enhancing? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like. There's just so many variables with it. Well, it, it kind of goes back to... But that was the thing. In Lawrence Taylor's time, everyone is doing it. Right. <laughs> it, it goes back to where do you draw the line of merit as a performing baseball player, performing football player, their performance at their sport, and then what they do off the field or on the sidelines, and how big of an asshole they are. But, you, but if you don't think getting coked up before you... Are trying to like fucking someone's. Tr- have you ever tried to? I have not t- tried to do cocaine and play in a professional football game. No, but have you ever tried to tackle someone who's fucking out of their mind, gone on anything? No, it's I, ridiculous. I, I have not. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> but then you can say that about like I don't know. I guess it's where you draw the line. It's like with the Asher scandal. Yeah, people have been stealing signs for years, but they haven't been using high def cameras and buzzers for years. Right. That's but that's what I'm saying. And you can also like. If you talk to any baseball players, they'd be like, I'd rather you talk to any pitcher and they're they'll or any batter. I'd go I No, I'm sorry, any pitcher. If you talk to any pitcher, they say I'd rather have a whole nine man lineup lineup of Barry Bonds clones than have a normal baseball lineup where they know what I'm gonna throw. I disagree. That's what every baseball pitcher says. Interesting. I wanna if you're a baseball pitcher, I want you to comment on this because I feel like you see guys like Mariano who just threw the cutter. And you knew what was coming. And even if you made contact with it, you wouldn't put it where you wanted. Where Barry Bonds was just so, just so yeah, but it's not... joke that any time he made contact, the ball was gone. But you also have to understand, signs are, just, are not just for which pitch. It's for 
which pitch you're going to get, the location. Are you throwing high? Are you throwing low? Are you yeah, throwing? Pitches aren't a hundred percent accurate. If it could be set up, you know, low and in, and the pitch goes up and away, you can miss it because you you got the sign right. The pitcher got the pitch wrong. You right. know what I mean? But you have to. But the pitcher, my job is to execute as best I can. So if you're saying if I execute, it's going to give you more of a chance to hit the ball. That's a problem. Unless you have a good fielder. I mean, there are guys like Greg Maddox who made a whole career, and he wasn't necessarily a strikeout pitcher. He would get guys to put the ball in play. Yeah, but what, I, what, what I'm saying is, if I know you're going low and away, I can adjust my swing. I can do everything else. It's not, like, it's not, just, it's not just, oh, he's going to throw a fastball. Oh, he's going to throw a curveball. They know he's attempting to throw a fastball high inside. You know what I mean? I know exactly Every, what you're saying. Everything. So, I'm but you're saying, oh, the pitcher can make a mistake, and it could be, not be there. But I'm saying is, so my job is to execute, to hit that spot. So I hit that spot. Now it's more likely that you're going to hit the ball because I hit my spot. And because saying, I did my job correctly. But I'm saying, even if, okay, like, I know exactly what the pitch is going to be. If I hit it as hard as I can, as strong as I can, it could still be a fly ball to the outfield, and the outfielder gets it, and inning over. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's baseball. If, if, if you're supposed to go up and away and you're like a quarter of an inch higher than you expected, that could be a pop-up. Whereas if you're 30 pounds more muscular than you were last season, what would be a routine fly ball is now a home run. What would be a routine grounder to second base is now a line drive and it's a double. Like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I understand what you're saying, but what I'm saying is Steroids did not make Barry Bonds as good of a hitter as he is. It made him hit more home runs. You just said it yourself that look at Altuve's drop off this year. Right. It made him a good hitter. That's fair. You're right. You're right. Like, do you understand like where I'm coming from? Yeah, definitely. Definitely both bad things to do. Yeah, yeah definitely I'm, cheating. I'm, is for- I'm not trying to say and that's why I think, anything's good. And that's why I think absolutely none of them are going to make the Hall of Fame. From the Astros, those championship teams, I think they're just going to all have that that stain on their record. I they're not going to get that stench off of them. But we were just saying it already feels like it's off of them. Well, yeah, because you had a pandemic. People got distracted. There's I know a they got they got fucking so lucky. They got so I'm not convinced that they didn't create the pandemic to distract us all. <laughs> I'm just saying it sounds like something they would do. I'm just saying one year ago, last January, we were all talking fuck the Astros, fuck the Astros, fuck the Astros. Bam! Some dude ate a bat. Now we're all sick. Actually, a little, not, a little now more. that I think about it, time's up. They might have helped you out. Explain. You think the Mets are in a good position now, right? Hell yeah. You, you like the coach? Or like the general manager? You like Steve Cohen coming in? I like Steve Cohen coming in. That all could have not happened if... um. Why can't I think of his name right now? Didn't get fired from you the like day after you hired him. Oh, uh, Beltron? Yeah. Because of that scandal. Nah, Steve C- Cohen was trying to buy them before then. Yeah, but if they had a if they had a decent season, like if they had a better season than where they were at, and like they made more money, like say they went on a run. I'm nah, not saying they would have. Is the pandemic. The b- the Will Ponds sold because of the pandemic, but I see what right, you're saying. Right. The pandemic wouldn't have happened if the Astros didn't cheat. Right, didn't right. Exactly, exactly. It all <laughs> it's just like I mean what a rough time to be a Houston sports fan. You just lost Harden coming to New York. You lost yeah, Watson. Rough. He's on his way to New York. The Astros. Springer just went to the Blue Jays, and the Astros are assholes. I mean, it's not even that. It's just you don't know if that team was actually as good as you thought it was. Yeah. We'll never know. No one will ever know. I'm I mean, also, yeah, they did get back to the LDS, I believe. I don't know. I'm excited to see what happens in a real season coming up with. Yeah, everything. everyone acts like last season was this big deal. It's a 60-game season out of 162. And you only played teams in your division. Yeah, and it's like, that's not even, that's like a third of the season. Literally, yes. And how many times have we been like, yo, oh man, the Yankees are going to do it this year, or the Mets are going to do it this year after the first third of the season, and then they nosedive. All right, yeah, we, don't, we know, we know. But you yeah, know that, what, no, but no, you, no, no. you know the point no, I'm making. I know what you mean. That's a very Mets thing to do. If they get off to a hot start and then fall apart and then slowly put it back together. So, like, yeah. Like, I'm not one of those people that thinks, oh, it's a COVID cup. This should have more of an asterisk than the, Ast- than the Astros one because at least they played. No. They, they did what – they did the only thing they were allowed to do, and they won the title. Fucking great for them. 
Yeah, no, take it all with a grain of salt. And, like, we were talking about this off the air about Trevor uh, Bauer, about how as great as he was last year, you got to take it with a grain of salt when you're talking about throwing $40 million at a guy who just won a Cy Young in a pandemic-shortened season. Yeah. Where he only faced teams in the Central. So he was facing, like, the Tigers, the Royals, the... Uh, he only had 11 starts. Pirates, yeah. 11 starts out of the normal, like, 30 a guy would get. Yeah. No, I'd still love to see him on the Mets, but, yeah, no, you're right. You can have him. I'll gladly take him. Because, like, you also have to understand, he's... A little nut. Yeah. Like, the throwing the, the fucking baseball thing because the guy took him out. Like Yeah, he cut his hand You're a, You're a grown man. He also cut his hand and had to miss a month because he was cleaning his drone and accidentally turned it on when he was cleaning it. He's an interesting character. Yeah. All right. Um... Uh- we got a little bit of bit basketball. Should we just wrap the show up? Um, I'm down for whatever. Well, just wanted to say it's been the one year anniversary since the passing of Kobe Bryant. Uh yeah, it, it that that whole thing kind of it hits me extra because January 26th is also my birthday. Um, happy and, birthday. And yeah, like I'm not gonna lie, like didn't feel like my birthday this year. You know what I mean? Like, I felt it heavy. Yeah. Just because it gave me that kind of personal attachment to it. And I was such a huge Kobe and Shaq fan growing up. Yeah. For a whole generation, myself included, very much so. So this this whole thing is, it, it was very, it was very weird for me. Yeah, it was one of those moments where we all just kind of like, you, you know where you were when you found out. Like, oh, yeah. I remember I was at a Greek restaurant with my girlfriend on a Sunday. I first got it from a TMZ. Someone sent me the TMZ link, and I was like, dude, it's TMZ. Like, they said they found Sasquatch. Like, it hit. Uh, it was very emotional the next couple of days. I'm a very big Kobe Bryant fan, so that hurt. Yeah, I was. I think a, a lot of us growing up, like you said. I was driving home from work. I remember the exact road I was on, the exact spot in the road. Came up on ESPN. It was the last. It was a fill-in guy, so I don't remember his name. It wasn't. Like one of their their actual lineup, so that's the only thing I don't remember. But it was literally the last thing he said on the show. And he's just like, "Oh, sorry, just I have to say this." Like he was wrapping up his show. And he's just like, "Okay, but before we get off, I have to say this uh, breaking news: Kobe Bryant passed away in a helicopter crash." And then just ended the show, and I was just sat there like, "Wait, what?" Yeah, <laughs> not very. Very heartbreak. Ooh. Damn. Don't want to end the show on such a bleak note. And that's the thing. It's not just Kobe. There was also his daughter, Gianna, who never, like, who was a child, didn't get to live her dreams. But there was also, I believe, 11 other people on that helicopter. Yeah, it, was a, it was a very tragic. It was just, tragic it was a whole thing. I I wanted to have their list of names, but I just, I didn't, I didn't have time, or, and I didn't really remember to get all the list of names. But I want to throw it out to Kobe and his family, Vanessa, the other girls, and the rest of the families. Like, I think the whole world is with all of you. Yeah, absolutely. And that was, you know, the silver lining was that the unity that the basketball community, everyone with their tributes. Sports community, honestly. The whole sports world, yeah. Everyone wearing 24, everyone wearing 8, you know. Everyone. Everyone around the world. You see the murals all across the world, the paintings, just. That outcry is such a beloved person. And I think everyone can identify with someone. Kobe was great because he outworked every other person in the room. Yeah, absolutely. I read the book Showboat. Uh, It's a 600-page biography about Kobe. I read it after last last year everybody passed. And that's just from from the time he was a freshman in high school. He just knew I wanted to be the best, and he studied game film of Michael Jordan when he was in growing up in Italy he would have his grandparents send him tapes of the NBA finals and he would just study and just study and just work and just work he was just a, you know a different a different breed just truly a different kind of human just so dedicated to his craft so he he even said after his career was over if I could get Shaq on my regiment I would have had seven more rings <laughs> yeah that would have been something. Uh, a lot of depressing news today. A lot of depressing news. We gotta come up with something happy to end the show. Um, 
We talk about we talk about LeBron being petty as hell in the best way. Yeah. LeBron and Cleveland. So at least it's some positive Laker news. Yeah, so for the Lakers, I mean your team's really good. LeBron and the Lakers were in Cleveland. They had fans in the crowd, but not a lot, so in limited capacity, you could still hear everything. Courtside, one of the execs for the Cleveland Cavaliers like stood up, standing applause, clapping for LeBron missing a jump shot. Like went so hard. Like was literally mocking the guy. And LeBron took it personal and he went off and he led them to a win. Jordan meme. I took that personally. <laughs> <laughs> you got right now the Lakers just heading above, just just better than everyone else. The Clippers are, are on, you know, Clippers are a great team. The Utah Jazz have now won 10 in a row. They got the third best record. I don't think they're in that same category. I think it's, No, not at all. I think it's, you got the Lakers all the way up top. A drop below is the Clippers. Then maybe a drop below that. You got, you know, the Bucks and maybe the Sixers are looking good. But it's gonna be, it's the Lakers title to lose. Yeah. I just like watching games. I think, and I'll give them credit because they're, them, they're making it work a lot better than I thought they were going to. I think the Nets, if they can make a couple trades before the deadline to bolster their defensive capabilities a well, little bit. You want to make a trade, don't use Robin Hood because Robin Hood has decided that they're not letting people trade GameStop and AMC anymore. So fuck Robin Hood. Uh, look at that dive on another day. Oh, my God. I, I, I love this. Buy, GameStop, hold, GameStop. We're winning. We're winning. <sighs> That's all I got. Um, yeah, but just my one thing on the LeBron thing, it's just when it happened, you just saw LeBron look, and you just saw that look of, in his eyes. It was almost like it was, it was almost like a Kobe or a Jordan look of, oh, you know you just fucked up, right? You flipped the switch. You just fucked up, right? You, like, you know that. <laughs> He flipped that switch, and that's the thing. Is like you watch the Lakers, and you know that if they're playing, you know, sixty-five percent strength, sixty-five percent full speed, they'll still win. When yeah. they want, when LeBron gets that motivation to flip the switch, and he goes all the way up to hundred, it's over. It's yeah. it's theirs. They're just winning. All right, I think that's it for us today. Thank you guys for listening along. If you're on YouTube. Make sure to hit that like, subscribe, hit that little bell, turn on them notifications. If you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review. If you're on any podcasting site, we're on a fucking whole shit ton of them. There's Spotify, there's Anchor. There's Pocket Cast, Overcast. We're on a lot of shit. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, there, we're there. Just, Just start, leave us reviews on fucking everything. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, find us on Facebook. Let us know what you think. Leave us a comment. We we'll shout you out on the show. And we throw out some extra... We throw out a bunch of extra content on Instagram and Twitter, so make sure you find those. Um, yeah, but I'm Chris Gray, Eric Mincer. I'm just going to assume Dev says he loves y'all, and bye. Love but you. I'll see you. Love you guys. Welcome to the basement.